What's going on guys? Hope you're a great day today. Today we're going to continue our discussion in the book of Job. We're going to be in chapter 34 verse 1 through verse 9. And in this portion of, of Job 34, we're going to see Elihu begin speaking once again to Job. He's going to first reason with the people who are listening that they ought to hear his words and, and hear the words of Job as well and, and to try the words to see if they are true, to discern them, to see what is the right and good judgment. We're going to see that Job clenches to his integrity still and that's part of Elihu's argument against Job. And then lastly, we're going to see the fact that we ought to be delighting in God. Not the, the things of this world, not the, the, the riches and the, and the luxuries and the status and the fame of, the, of, of this life, but in God. For everything, everything else comes to nothing. So it's important that we live our lives for God and not for ourselves. But see, Elhu goes on fo- speaking following chapter 33, right? In chapter 33, Elhu worked out his argument that God was good to his people, even through trials and difficulties. Right, if we remember in chapter 33, we saw that Elihu spoke of God's chastening hand, that God disciplines his people, and he often uses sufferings in this life to wake us up in a sense, to, to draw us nearer and draw us back to God. For when we start to trust in the things of the world and we start to indulge in them and enjoy them in a sinful manner, it's important that God shows us our frailty, God shows us our weakness and shows us our need for him, that we might draw, be drawn nearer to him and away from the things of the world. But see, in chapter 34, Elihu expounds this argument, or explains the argument that he had in 33, by speaking of God's perfection, God's wisdom, God's justice, and God's power. Now, in the first nine verses, we're not going to see much of that, because in the first nine verses, Elihu really is opening up his argument by speaking of Job and Job's circumstance. So before we see the glory of God in his righteous judgment, Elihu finds it necessary to show how man is often futile in his ways of thinking. So we go to to Job chapter 34 and we read verse 1 through verse 9. The Bible says this. Furthermore, Elihu answered and said, Hear my words, O ye wise men, and give ear unto me, that ye have knowledge, or ye that have knowledge. For the ear trieth words, as the mouth tasteth meat. Let us choose to us judgment. Let us know among ourselves what is good. For Job hath said, I am righteous, and God hath taken away my judgment. Should I I lie against my right? My wound is incurable without transgression. What man is like Job, who drinketh up scorning like water, which goeth in company with the workers of iniquity, and walketh with wicked men? For he hath said, It profiteth a man nothing, that he should delight himself with God. So if we just once again read verse 2 to verse 4, here we're going to see Elihu's argument that we ought to hear the words of Job and, and test his words, but also in like manner hear the words of Elihu and test his words and see what is true. So in verse 2 it says, Hear my words, O ye wise men, and give ear ear unto me, ye that have knowledge. For the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth meat. Let us choose to us judgment. Let us know among ourselves what is good. So he he says, Hear my words, O ye wise men. He wants them to hear his words. He wants them to incline their ear and hear the words that Elihu has to say in regards to the matter. And it's very interesting. If we remember Elihu speaking formerly about Job's friends, he had claimed that they were not wise. He had claimed that they were men who, who lacked understanding in a sense because they falsely accused Job and falsely understood the judgment of God. But here in verse 2, he says, O ye wise men, right? Hear my words, O ye wise men, and give ear unto me, ye that have knowledge. And if you remember, Elihu is not a man who gives flattering words, right? Elihu does not know how to flatter a man, he says in the prior chapters. So here it would be really unwise, I think, if, we're, if we think that he is directly speaking to Job's friends. For he had called them foolish men, and now we see that he might be calling them men of wisdom, men of, of understanding, of knowledge. And so it can either be reason that Elihu is speaking generally or sarcastically. right? There might, might be the case, in, and I would hold to this view, that there are have become a, almost a crowd around them. That it's not just Job and his friends now. It is some people who have gathered near him and are listening to the arguments of Elihu brought forth against Job. And so I think Elihu is probably speaking in a general sense that if there are any wise here, if there are any wise men, listen, understand, hear the words of Job, hear my words, and and discern what is true, discern what is the right judgment, discern what is good. Right, so we see that Elihu has made it clear that he thinks Job's friends to be foolish in their argumentation against Job. Thus, it would be strange to call them wise and knowledgeable men. So like I said, I believe that he is making a general plea for the wise men. If there be any wise men, listen, hear my words, hear 
the words of Job, and let's establish the cause of what is right and what is just and what is true according to the words that have been spoken. But if we continue on and we, and we look at verse 3, it says, For the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth meat. See, this is the, point, uh, the importance of discernment. This is the importance of discretion and understanding. That we ought to try words. You know, the Bible says that we ought to try the spirits to know to, and see whether they are of God or not. And that's also important. But we see a truth that it's important that we try words. As the mouth tastes meat. Right? We ought to listen and discern. For these are vital. And they are, yet they are often lacking. We often do not really hold tight to the words of man. We, we kind of blow them off. But it's important that we listen and discern. What is the motive behind them? What is the truth of the words being spoken? For these are great and important matters that we must labor to understand. Right? With the mouth, men discern what tastes good and bad. Right? Man knows what to spit up. He knows what to di- digest. Furthermore, he knows what is healthy for him and what is harmful to him. We know all this to be true with food. We know what food is good for us. We know what food is bad for us. We know what food what will benefit us in the long run and what food will hurt us in the long run. What foods will bring about health and, and longevity and what foods will make us obese and, and give us an earlier uh, death. We know these things to be true of food. But here Ellie was saying that we ought to have that same discretion, that same understanding, that same prudence when it comes to hearing and trying words. That we ought to know what is good for us to hear. We ought to know what is good for us to reject. So in like manner, we ought to listen wisely. We ought to try or, or, or test and discern the words that are spoken. From good words, we can gain a greater understanding. We can know the words that are good and those that are bad. We can differ- differentiate those that are profitable and those that are harmful. As is food sometimes, we need the hard words of admonishment or admonition to be directed to the right course. Right? For example, if, if we're going to decide whether we're going to eat some broccoli or, or some ice cream, and I don't, I don't believe, like, obviously we can have both in a sense, right? It, it comes down to, it's an illustration. But if we know that broccoli is good for us, yet we reject the broccoli and we eat the ice cream, and we know that it's bad for us, we know that it's harmful for us, we might reap the consequences from it. But we know that it's bad for us, yet we choose it because it tastes good to us. So in like manner, there are those who have itching ears, who want to hear what's good, they want to hear what, what pleases their flesh, what makes them feel better about themselves, and they reject all notions of truth that might conflict with the good things being spoken to them. But in the same manner, sometimes we have to we have to just put our hand to the plow and and, and eat the broccoli to receive the healthful benefits. So in like manner, a, a word that is might might be harsh could be a good thing for us if it directs us away from sin and towards righteousness. But also in like manner, when a man eats what's bad for him. He often knows that it's bad for him. And when we're, we're hearing bad words and we're trying the words, and, and not even necessarily like vulgar words, but just words that are not true, and we know them to be untrue, we know them to be false, we ought to reject them. We ought to refuse them. For we know that in the, in the end they will be worse for us than even if they bring forth a temporal benefit. They will harm us in the later end. And if we continue on to verse 4, we see it says, Let us choose to us judgment. Let us know among ourselves what is good. Right? So we try the words. We understand the words. And now we must apply our understanding. We must choose to us judgment. Choose to us what is right. Choose to us what is good. And it says, Let let us know among ourselves what is good. Right? So sometimes it's a labor. Sometimes even harmful and untrue words are crafted in a a deceitful manner that, that is hard for the listener to discern. But we ought to labor for it, labor to see what is true, labor to see what is good. Right? We ought to choose what is right, choose to know what is good. So it's an action. Not merely an understanding of it, but choose it, go after it, search it further, and apply it to our lives. See, not merely what sounds good, but what is true. Right? He says in verse 4, let us choose to us judgment. Let us choose to us what is right. Yet too often people choose what is right based off if they agree with it, if they like it. They don't care if it's true or not, so long as it makes them feel better, so long as it uplifts them. Though it might be untrue, it might be more damaging to them than what they realize. So we ought to choose what is true, choose what is right, choose what is good, not merely what feels good. 
But see, we ought to labor for it, search for it, and once it is known, act upon it or believe upon it. Right? Like I mentioned, it's hard sometimes to discern what is true, but we ought to not just blow it off to the side, but search out a matter to see if it's true, to see if it's good. And of course, the ultimate authority is the Scripture. We ought to go to the Bible and test the, the words of the, of the world and compare it to the Bible. If the Bible contradicts it, we always go with what the Bible clearly says. For the Bible is the Word of God. It has the full authority. It has all truth. And there is no error in it. But it just goes to show us that we ought to be wise. We ought to be prudent. We ought to be diligent in searching out what is true. Not merely what feels good, but what is good according to the veracity of it. And we continue on to verse 5 through verse 6. It says, For Job hath said, I am righteous, and God hath taken away my judgment. Should I lie against my right? My wound is incurable without transgression. So here we see the, the reasoning for verse 1 through 4. Eli was saying we ought to try the words. We ought to understand words. And here is going to be going to be quoting Job and his words. And in a sense, putting him on the trial. What does Job mean by this? Can we see the, the foolishness that Job has spoken of in a sense? And, and just to get my, my thoughts out there for a moment. What Elihu is saying here, sometimes he is directly quoting Job. And sometimes he is paraphrasing or summarizing the arguments of Job. So it's important that we keep that in mind. These are not necessarily direct quotations, but is the argument that, that Elihu has gotten from the multitude of words that Job has spoken. All right, so he says, For Job has said, I am righteous, and God hath taken away my judgment. It's important that we note that, that Job is an upright man. Right? Job is a blameless man. He's a man who loves God. So in that sense, he is a righteous man, but in the sense of, of being sinless, he is not. Right, Job is not without sin. Job is not like a holy, perfect being. But he is a man who loves God. And so Job, even though he's a wise man, a godly man, he is still but a man. And he is able to, to act or to speak foolishly. Right, He is a merely a man who can understand the ways of God. Who can understand the perfect judgment of God. And I say that because we, not, we ought not to look at Job as like, this heinous man who has spoken foolishly, but a godly man who has spoken foolishly, that it is possible. And that's why we all need Christ. We all need the Savior of the world, the one who bore our sins, died the death that we deserve upon the cross, and rose again. That's why we need a Savior, for we are all prone to sin. And I don't think it's, this should be used harshly against Job, but it's just a, an admonishment that Elihu is bringing towards him, that Job, you have spoken foolishly in a sense. That Job was guilty of directly quoting that God had taken away my judgment, God had taken away my right. Right? Job is, when he spoke of that, he was saying in a sense that God has dealt unjustly with me, for I have not sinned. And when Job had spoken of not sinning, he was speaking of a specific great sin causing this calamity. So Elihu is bringing that point against Job that Job, you claim that you were a righteous man, that God has in some way perverted judgment by bringing this calamity upon you. And what you have spoken of in that sense is false because you don't understand the judgment of God. You don't understand the righteousness and the holiness of God. You don't understand that God is right in all of his ways. And that is the argument that Elihu is bringing towards Job. And we see in verse 6 it says, Should I lie against my right? My wound is incurable without transgression. And this is going back to the the fact when Job was being questioned by his friends, Job was like, should I just concede my righteousness? Should I just um, admit that I have done this sin, that you ought to leave me alone? And of course, he was not willing to do that, right? He did not want to to lie about a sin that he did not commit in order to please his friends. He He held fast to his righteousness. He clung to his righteousness, and that's not a bad thing. But the part of it is that he clinged to his righteousness more than the true judgment of God. And that's Elihu's admonition, his reproof against Job. But he also says in verse 6, My wound is incurable without transgression, saying that God has brought this upon me without any transgression of my own. Again, hearkening back to that, that he's questioning the judgment of God. And it's okay to, to ask of God, it's okay to plead with God, but to question God in a, a demeaning sense is always wrong, for God is always right. And we ought to trust Him in all of His ways, trust Him in all of His judgments, for He's a good God who is without sin. But we see that Job did not want to lay down his righteousness. As I mentioned, he says, we, or, we should never stop striving to do what is right in the eyes of God, 
Right? We should always strive to do what's good, to do what's right, to do what's holy and honorable. We should always strive to please God. And no sickness or weakness should ever excuse us to sin. Yet Job in this calamity has, in a sense, well, really, he has sinned by foolishly speaking in some matters. Right? Job is a wise man. I don't want to question that. He is a good man who loves God. But in the midst of this calamity, he has spoken some foolish things, and that is why Elihu is speaking towards him in this manner. But see, nevertheless, this, is, this calamity is not about Job's righteousness. Instead, it is about God's glory. And that is almost where Job has gone wrong. He's made it more about himself. He's focused it upon him and his righteousness and his goodness and his, his works before God. And he has forgot just to stand still and know that God is God. That his ways are pure and perfect and just. And I think too often we do that in our own lives where we look at uh, things that are happening to us and we question, why is this happening to me, God? One who loves you, one who serves you, one who honors you. But see, we, not, we ought not to think that way. We ought to just trust God. Even that He is pure and perfect in all of His ways, that He is good. That He is a good and loving Father to those who trust in Him. Then we continue on to verse 7 through verse 9. It says, What man is like Job, who drinketh up scorning like water, which goeth in company with the workers of iniquity, and walketh with wicked men? For he hath said, It profiteth a man nothing that he should delight himself with God. And verse 9 is a very strong accusation against Job, which I think Elihu has really spoken too harshly or, or too generally. For, for Job does not think that it does not profit a man to delight in God. I don't believe. But we will get there. But first we'll start in verse 7. It says, What man is like Job who drinks up scorning like water? And here he's just saying that, that Job, of course, has endured scorning. Right? Job has endured great scorning and mocking from his three friends. They have falsely accused him. They have grossly mischaracterized him as a wicked man under the judgment of God. And in that sense, he has been drinking up scorning, drinking up ridicule. But Elihu is using this as a reproof against Job. So it's not merely the fact that Job is receiving ridicule, for that's no blemish against Job. But it's the, it's the reason of why he's receiving much of the ridicule and the scorning that he is. Right? Some of Job's words have been foolish. And these words have, as the fool's words do, Open Job up for scrutiny. Right? If a man speaks foolishly, if a man speaks perverse things, untrue things, as a fool does, he opens himself up for scrutiny, for reproof, for correction. He opens himself up for that, for he has spoken out of turn. And in some sense, Job has done so. And so not only is he drinking up with like water, but he's almost opened himself up to it by some of the words, not all, right? but by some of the words that he has spoken, which mischaracterize the true judgment of God. In that sense, he is drinking of uh, scorning like water. But also verse 8, which goeth in company with the workers of iniquity and walketh with, with wicked men. And we must understand that, that Job is an, a righteous man. Once again, we cannot forget that. He is a, a man who has not lived a lifestyle of walking with wicked men who work iniquity. Right? It seems that Elihu is speaking of this moment as Job has sat with his friends. So in other words, it's not saying that Job lives a life of, of, of fellowship with wicked men. For he doesn't, right? He's a man who fears God, who loves God, who hates evil. So he's obviously not walking a daily life with wicked, with wicked men. But Elihu seems to be pointing to the mindset of Job, that it has been sort of shifted to the same mindset that a wicked man has. Right? Job has, in some sense, thought of the judgments of God in a similar way as the wicked man. Right? When we look at the arguments of Job's friends, where they are so adamant that God always punishes evil at the moment it occurs and God always rewards good at the moment it occurs which is not true right God does punish evil God does punish sin he does love good and reward good but we may not always see those fruits in this life we may not always see those fruits and those judgments in a very quick manner for God is a patient and long-suffering God whose will is not that any should perish but see, having alluded to both the wicked man and the righteous man perishing in a, in a f former chapter, Elihu is using these words that Job spoke to say that he has almost shifted his mind to think the same way that his friends do, to think the same way that the wicked man thinks, to almost pervert God's judgment in that sense. Right? If we go to Job chapter 9, verse 22, we see the verse that Elihu is more than likely referring to in verse 8 and in verse 9. 
But he says, this is one thing, therefore I said it. He destroyed the perfect and the wicked. And that's Job speaking, saying that God destroys the perfect and the wicked. And right, this is not a true characterization of, of God's perfect judgment. He does not destroy those who are good. Of course, there is none good, good but God, but he does not punish people who practice good things, in a sense, right? If, if we're doing what's right, God's not going to punish you for doing what's right. He's not going to punish a man who is doing what's good. Now, of course, we all need Christ, for we've all fallen short of the glory of God, no doubt. But with, with Job's statement in, in chapter 9, verse 22, he's almost saying that God punishes those who are doing good just as he punishes those who are doing wicked, which in a general sense is not true according to God's perfect judgment. However, it is a truth that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Right? God does not show partiality, and we live in a fallen world, a sinful world, and we go through difficulties, even those who, who are trusting in Christ, even those who follow after God and, and try to live a life that's honoring and glorifying to Him. The rain falls on them as well as it falls on the wicked man. And light man, the sun shines on both men as well. So we cannot see God's judgment as this black and white picture. But God, of course, He judges righteously and goodly. But it's, always, it's not always in the way that we see it. For God knows the end from the beginning, and He is all wise. He knows all things. But we look at verse 9, and this is where, like I said, I think Elihu has gone a bit too far in, in his wording here. For he hath said, speaking of Job, It profiteth a man nothing that he should delight himself with God. And as I mentioned, we see kind of the picture of that in, in chapter 9, verse 22, where he's talking about the wicked man and the good man will both perish. In a general sense, that's true, right? We're all going to die unless the Lord comes before then. We're all going to taste of death. But let it be known that those who trust in Christ have eternal life, have everlasting life, and will not truly taste death. Yes, physically, but not spiritually. So Job was wrong in that, in that view of, of, of verse 22 in chapter 9. But we must see that Job has previously discussed the wickedness of the evil man and how they delight in pleasures, yet they forget the God who gave them life. Why we've seen in prior chapters where there are rich men in this world who abound greatly. They are wicked men, yet they are abounding more greatly, at least by worldly means, than those who are just and those who love God. But Job was not advocating for this. Job was showing the, the futility of this. That though they abound greatly in this world in their wickedness, they will ultimately perish. So it must be understood that, that Job is not advocating that that they receive greater things and thus delighting in God is not profitable. Job is not advocating that by any means. Right? Yet, the, the, they delight in the riches and they, and they don't delight in God. And yet they profit physically, often greater than the godly in this world. Yet what is the true profit? What is the true profit of gaining this whole world and losing your soul as we see Christ speaking of in the New Testament? And Job had explained many times in the book of Job that they come to nothing. So I don't think it's fair to really establish the case that Job thinks that delighting in God is, is without profit. That Job has described many times, like I mentioned, that, that you might gain greatly in this world living a wicked life, but you're going to come to your end and, and lose it all. But the righteous man flourishes because he, he trusts in God, and not even physically, but his soul can be at rest knowing that he has trusted in God and he is following after God. So let us not forget that the argument from the devil that began all this, right? I think it's very important in the context of verse 9, saying that it profited the man nothing, that he should align himself with God. I think it's important that we look at the very first, uh, the first chapter of Job and what really kickstarted this whole argument with the devil coming to God and saying this in verse 9 of chapter 1. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And I think this is important to the context of verse 9, because in a worldly sense, Job was profiting. He had great riches. He had great uh, flocks of sheep and of, of, of livestock. He was a wealthy man. He was a, a man held high in the eyes of man, even. So Job was prospering in a worldly sense. And we see in verse 11 where the devil says, If you take away all this, he will curse thee to thy face. Now we don't ever see Job curse God. So the devil was found to be a liar. 
But furthermore, I think this points us to the fact that to delight in God is everything. Because Job loses all of his riches. He loses all of these things. And yes, we have seen him, as we've talked about, speak foolish things. Because he doesn't truly understand the judgment of God. As none of us really do. In a perfect sense. But nonetheless, he is still hoping in God. Nonetheless, he is still delighting in God. And seeking after God. Right, so the point of life is to love, serve, fear, and delight in God. See, many are enamored by pleasures in this life. And they use, they use God, in a sense, as a means to acquire them. Like false religion. False reverence of God. People who, who merely bear the name of God but do not love God. They use God to gain the pleasures of this world. Yet the one who truly loves God will delight in him no matter how poor he may physically be. <clears throat> and I believe that to be the case of Job. I believe even in the midst of these unwise words that he has spoken, that Elihu is reproving him for, he's still delighting in God. He's still trusting in God. He still sees God as, as his Lord, as the one who will provide, as the one who will restore him. And I think we ought to also have that same view. That yes, we may not always understand what God is doing in his infinite and perfect will. We can't understand it in its entirety. It's impossible for us to understand the ways of God. But we can seek God. We can search the scriptures and, and discover more of the character of God. We can go to God in prayer and depend upon him more and delight in him more and hope and trust and, 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 and love him more. But let us not delight in the things of this world. That if it's all gone tomorrow, what will we hope in? What will we trust in? <clears throat> will we have hope still? And if we're delighting in the things of the world, we will have no hope. But so long as we delight in God, our hope is never failing. Our hope is never ending. For we are secure in Christ. We are secure in the Lord. And our souls have been reconciled to God when we trust in Christ. Therefore, our hope is everlasting. It is a firm foundation that cannot be shaken no matter what life may bring. But let us trust in God, trust in His ways, trust in His judgments, and delight in Him. Ours, me, you're not alone. Jesus loves you. I love you. Have a blessed rest of your day.